I think we'll go ahead and get started. We'll, I'll watch for folks coming into the, uh, the waiting room. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And can you let me know if you can see that? Yep. Great. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Great. All right. <clears throat> all right. And I can see all of you as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really excited about talking with you tonight about journeying with St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul is the apostle that I didn't used to like, and I'll explain that why I'll explain why later. But I have grown to really love St. Paul, uh, and I wanted to share that that love of St. Paul with you. Um, I have a disclaimer that I always give, and that is that I'm not a biblical scholar or a biblical historian or a theologian, and I do my research, but I might not always get everything right, and I might not uh, have a complete or total picture, um, and I welcome questions, or if you have an understanding that I don't, I welcome you to participate in that. Um, I just know, and I think you know too, um, that we all have a love of learning and uh, all love exploring our faith and and our theology and scripture and biblical characters. Um, and, uh, and so I hope we can have a really, really good discussion tonight. I'm just gonna check and see if there's anyone in the waiting room. I don't think so. Okay. Well, we're going to get started here. And I'd like to begin with a prayer. And this is actually a prayer that St. Paul wrote. And so um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to share this with you. Maybe we could all pray it together, actually. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you share in our sufferings so also you share in our consolation. I think that's just a, a beautiful prayer um, that, that Paul has written. And in fact, as we uh, work through the next few weeks in our course, there are other prayers that Paul has written. Um, sometimes we don't even know about them. or We don't see them as prayer, but I think this is a, a lovely way to start out our evening tonight. Okay, so the journey. Um, tonight, we'll talk about all about Paul and the Pauline letters. And then on March 7th, we'll talk about travels with Paul. He, Paul has four journeys that he takes. Next week, we'll talk about Paul's first and second journey. And then on March 21st, we'll travel with Paul again on his third and fourth journey. And I'll talk with you more about what those journeys are as we move through uh, through the class tonight. If you have any questions, just let me know. I can't see everyone sometimes um, on the screen, so um, call out if you have a question. Okay. Same All right. Ramona. Ramona, this is Angie. So what I love about Saint Paul is he has a lot to say about himself. 
And um, these things that he says about himself are included in, uh, in his epistles or observed by other people. But these two sayings are about Paul. Paul says this about himself. And there's a quote from Romans where he says, he's identifying himself. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So he's, he's calling out who he is, right? So he's identifying as a follower of Jesus in this quote. But then in, in, uh, in, in Philippians, he says, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So what does that tell us about Paul, the reading from Philippians? Well, he was definitely a good Jew. Right. He was an observant Jew, right? He mm -hmm. was a Pharisee. He had zeal for his faith and the law. He also identifies as a persecutor of the church. What do you think it means to, as to righteousness under the law, blameless? Sorry, my dog's barking. <laughs> Sounds like he lived to the letter of the law rather than to his faith. Exactly. Exactly, Angie. Exactly. Say, so Ramona. Yes. Can you click uh, and play from um, the slideshow so we can see the your slide as the full Oh, screen? sure. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's okay. How's that? Good. Perfect. 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 Okay. Perfect. Folks, I'm sorry. Let me calm my dog. I'll be right back. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Angie. I didn't know what to tell her to click. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I like Paul, not the saint. Oh. Yeah. Hanson, that is. You're you're muted, Ramona. You're you're muted. Thank you. So here's some pictures of Paul, and I I love this because uh, it really gives a description of who he is. So there's a man whose name is um, o Onisirus, and he is a friend of Paul who visits Paul in prison. And his name translates to prophet or useful or blessing. And I'll tell you more about the story as we get further into the, into the class. Um, but here's his description of Paul. A man small of stature with a bold head and crooked legs in a good state of body with eyebrows meeting and nose somewhat hooked, full of friendliness for now he appeared like a man and now he had the face of an angel. So these are some, uh, some depictions of St. Paul. Um, here you can see the hooked nose and the eyebrows just about meeting right here. Um, this is a younger Paul, still with the hooked nose and the eyebrows. Uh, this is a younger version of Paul. What's he holding in his hands? He has a sword, right? He has a book. He has a pen, Holy Spirit. So often when we see um, images of St. Paul, he's always carrying the book. See it here. You see it here. You see it here. He's carrying the book. He's also carrying a sword, which signifies how he, how he died. He was beheaded. 
Um, but here you have four different images. Um, this one doesn't look like he's at all bald. Uh, this might be uh, an image of what they might think of as an older Paul, someone who had wisdom, gray hair, gray beard. Um, face of an angel, what do you think? Maybe this one, maybe <laughs> this one. <laughs> Full of friendliness, I'm not sure. Um, but just an idea of what, what the images look like of, of St. Paul. So who was Paul? Well, here's what we know about his, um, his early life. Um, he's believed to have been born about um, 4 BC. So right around the same time as Jesus was born, his given name was Saul, and he was named after the first king of Israel, right? So again, um, a, um, a practicing Jewish person from a Jewish family named their son Saul after the first king of Israel. He's from the city of Tarsus, um, now in eastern Turkey. What we know is that he, he spoke Greek. That was the language of the times. And that he was versed in rhetoric, the art of argument. So he knew how to make an argument with folks. Um, contrary to what a lot of people think, he wasn't from a wealthy family. The scholars say this. He wasn't from a wealthy family. Um, he was a tent maker by trade. So most um, Israel, Israelites who were men got to a certain age and they learned a trade. And so he was a, a tent maker. We know this because in Corinthians, he talks about, I worked with my own hands. And there are references to him being a, a tent maker. Um, we also know that he knew how to read and write. Um, there's a reference in, in um, Galatians about that. See, he tells us a lot about himself. We know he was an observant Jew. And in fact, he says, I am a Jew brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. And um, that was his teacher. So his teacher is one that has this really high reputation as a teacher of the law. So we know that Paul is learned and he's very steeped in the law of the Torah, right? So uh, just a, a, a map here. So here is Tarsus right here, okay? Here's Syria, Cyprus, um, Asia Minor and Asia, Asia, which is called Galatia. Um, you see Ephesus, the island of Crete, Corneth in Greece. Here's Greece, Thessalonica, Philippi. Okay, here's Italy, there's Rome, here's Sicily. And I'm showing you this map in part because while Paul is born in Tarsus, he travels over 10,000 miles when he is on his mission. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. I also want you to know where Tarsus is located. So here's the Mediterranean Sea. So Paul has acts, will have access to boats and ships, sailing ports. And also Tarsus was known as a very important commercial center. And it was also an intellectual center. So that's what we know about Paul, his early life, that he came from Tarsus, that he was educated, um, and um, he was an observant Jew. And all these things are really important when we get, when we talk more about what happened with Paul's revelation. Okay, more all about Paul. So Paul is a Pharisee. And he, he talks about this in Galatians. He says, in the presence of Iodeamos, which means Jewish faith and worship, I outstripped most of my Jewish contemporaries 
by my boundless devotion to the tradition of my ancestors, right? So he is an observant Jew among observant Jews. He does everything right. He follows the law. He does everything right. Now, I, I don't I don't want you to think that he is an obsessive person because that's not what it is. But in, in Judaism, to follow the law, to follow the Torah, to follow the rules and rituals is to become closer and closer to God. And so Paul, as a Pharisee, was doing that. So he, he was devoted to the traditions. He was very devoted because, because that brought him closer to God. Not that he was obsessive compulsive, not that we, he was above others. Although he kind of says that here, doesn't he? But that, <laughs> that <laughs> following the rules, following the Torah, following the oral traditions um, meant that each day you were closer and closer to God. And that's a, that's an important context for um, why, as we learn later in the beginning, he persecutes people who are followers of Jesus. So I think it's important just to understand who the Pharisees were and also who the scribes were, because sometimes in the Gospels, we use them interchangeably, or we'll say, and the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, so just some clarity around that. So um, the Pharisees were a Jewish sect. Okay, they were, they were part of Judaism, but they were a sect of Judaism. Think like in Christianity, you know, we have Baptists, we have Catholics, we have Episcopalians, we have congregational. It's it's the same sort of thing. So he was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees were a Jewish sect. Um, the Pharisees believed in very strict observance of the laws, and also so of the Torah, um, the written ceremony of the that's in the Jewish law. But they also included their oral traditions, which they called the traditions of the Father. So things that weren't written down, but had been passed down from generation to generation to generation, the wisdom um, of, of the, the traditions of the fathers. Um, also, most Pharisees were not wealthy. Um, they, uh, being a Pharisee wasn't their job, right? It was the sect that they belonged to. And so they were often landowners. They had a trade, like we believe Paul was a tent maker or they were traders, they traveled and they, and they traded. So Pharisees, Paul is a Pharisee. And then the scribes had <coughs> knowledge of the law, right? They could draft legal documents. So they understood the Jewish law, they could draft legal documents and it was a profession for them. This is what they did for a living. And it said in some of the research that every village had a scribe so the the person that um uh practicing jewish person would go to who had knowledge of the law who could draft up legal documents because not everyone could read or write and even people who could read may not have been able to write the scribes were specifically trained in writing um and it, it says that Paul, some of the research I was doing, it said that Paul was not a scribe in the sense that he couldn't make the small letters, the beautiful letters that the scribes could make. He could write big letters. So <laughs> he didn't have the skills of the scribe. Um, so the scribes had very particular training in writing and knowledge of the, of the law. So a little bit more about, about Paul. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to kind of lay things out in terms of his, his whole life. So um, we know he's born in Tarsus. His family moves to Jerusalem in 10 CE, Common Era. Um, and that's where he studies uh, under, uh, under uh, a famous Pharisee. Then he becomes a Pharisee in Jerusalem, so 20 to 30 CE. You know, he's in his 20s. He becomes a Pharisee. 
in Jerusalem. He joins that sect. Then in 30 to 34 CE, um, he, he has a very strong reaction to what's happening with followers, followers of Jesus, and he opposes the way, and we will talk a whole lot more about that. Then if you look uh, at kind of the second part of his life, on the road to Damascus, where he falls off of his horse, and this bright light comes down on him, and something changes for him, and we'll talk about that. He loses his sight, but his sight is restored. And then in uh, 38 to 46 CE, he starts preaching in Anatolia, which is in Turkey. Then he goes on other journeys. His, uh, as I mentioned before, Paul has four journeys that he makes. His first journey starts out in Antioch. Then he goes to the Council of Jerusalem where he and Peter, who's the rock of the church, right, have this huge discussion about what is required to be a follower of Jesus. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> His second journey, he goes to Syria. His third journey, he goes to Greece. And then he starts writing his epistles to the Romans. And then he has his final or fourth journey. And then uh, scholars believe he's martyred in Rome between 66 and 68 CE. So that's just a snapshot of his whole life. And his story is fascinating. So I just wanted to get into that a little bit. I'm gonna pause for a minute. Does anyone have questions? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So uh, it's really important to understand Paul, you have to understand what's going on. So what is the context of the time that Paul is living in? Um, so here's, here's what we know. Early Christianity is a part of Judaism. It's not outside Judaism. It's not considered a separate religion. It's like a sect, like the Pharisees are a sect, the Sadducees. So early Christianity, those who see Jesus as the Messiah, is part of Judaism. It's not separated at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. And um, if you were, I found this interesting that um, people, followers of Jesus, didn't call themselves followers of Jesus until the end of the first century. So that, that concept of being separate, a separate religion was not there. And then if you look in the New Testament, the term Christianity only occurs three times. It's in Acts and it's in Peter. Um, and um, so the word, the term only occurs three times. And remember that, um, that the, the, the Older Testament and a good part of the Newer Testament is the history of Jewish people, the Israelites, who are living under the opp opp oppression of some one, some other empire um, mm. in, their, in, in their lives. And, and this is really important to know. So keep in mind, early Christianity, it's a part of Judaism. Then there are some unknowns about Paul. There's often this big discussion about was Paul married or not? Because in a lot of his epistles, he speaks about his status as being single, and that being a good thing. But um, historians really don't know what his marital status was. Um, second, um, there are parts of the epistles, the later epistles, where it talks about Paul being flogged or stoned or shipwrecked or set upon by robbers. Um, but there's no real way to verify that because it wasn't written by Paul himself. It was written later. We'll mm -hmm. talk more about that shortly. And then there's also this lack of clarity about his death. So he was said to be beheaded in Rome between 66 and 68 CE. But um, most of the research says that that is uncertain, that there's no way, there's no 
uh, particular record that they can look to for that might have been passed down as an oral tradition that that's what happened to him. Um, so that's a little bit about about Paul. Ramona? Yes? Did the Romans treat him as somebody important or was he just another heretic? Um, he was he he was a Pharisee. He yeah. had little tolerance for um, the Roman Empire because as a as a, a practicing Jew uh, and as an observant Jew, he had lived under the oppression of the Roman Empire, which right, was but, vast. Right. right? But, how did, but, but how did the Romans treat him? How as, did the Rome? Oh, when he, when he goes to Rome? Yes. As 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 someone important or is he just another oh guy on the road? i get it so um he's seen as a rabble rouser mm -hmm. he's yeah. seen as a rabble rouser someone who can disrupt the peace um and he's seen as a rabble rouser by the romans but also by um some of the jews so i don't think he was a particularly popular person okay I don't, I don't think he was treated, I mean, I think he was known to the Romans, um, but not treated as a special person. I don't right. know if that makes any sense, but. Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, some more context, again, really important. Paul and Jesus never met. There's no record of them ever meeting, even though they were born around the same time. Um, and because Paul was a Pharisee, an observant Jew who um, followed the law and the oral traditions, what Jesus was talking about, which was, you don't always have to follow the law, <laughs> um, that really threatened Paul. And so when he heard about Jesus, who had died on the cross and risen from the dead, um, he really saw Jesus as a threat to the Jewish people. And he was worried that if you weren't observing God's law, like Jesus said, that that endangers the Jewish people, people who are observant, and God might punish them. Think of the Old Testament God as a God who punishes. God and the Israelites are in covenant with each other. They each have responsibilities. If you break the covenant with God by not observing the Torah and the oral traditions, God might punish you, okay? And then he finds out that Jesus tossed the temple, right? He turns over the tables, he yells at folks, and Paul sees this as a, a, a desecration of the holy temple. It's really interesting because he didn't see the desecration of the temple like Jesus saw it, which was money changers, he saw that Jesus disrupted the temple, and that was the, the desecration. And then Paul says um, that he is he's he looks, he can't, he can't understand, he cannot imagine why Jesus would be the Messiah. Right, because in uh, in in the um, Older Testament in Deuteronomy, there's a quote, and it says, "If a man guilty of a capital offense, as Jesus was, right, is put to death, and you hang him on a gibbet, which is a cross or a tree, his body must not remain on the tree overnight. You must bury him the same day." For the one who has been hanged is accursed by God, and you must not defile the land that Yahweh your God has given you. Oh. So Paul is looking back in the, in, in the scripture, and there's a prohibition here that if you commit a crime, that God, you've been accursed by God. God is not with you. God is not with you. Hmm. Um. And so this idea of Jesus being the Messiah, the one who was on trial, the one who was put to death, 
by the state. Um, the one who was accused by other Jewish people of being a heretic. Um, he couldn't see how it could possibly be that Jesus was the Messiah. And he mm -hmm. says it right here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you will remember um, the story of after Jesus' death, after he's crucified, um, his friends come and do take his body down. They ask the Romans. They do take his body down. So there is observation there. But the other thing is, Paul really didn't trust the Roman soldiers. And so because Paul wasn't at the cross and he didn't know Jesus, um, he couldn't be sure that that body was actually taken down. So that's a, a first issue for him. And the second issue is that Jesus was accursed by God. So Jesus was not in good relationship with God. So how... How could it be that Jesus was the Messiah? So right. that was a huge, huge struggle for Paul. So he has a rationale, right? He has a rationale for why he thinks the way he thinks. If Jesus was the Messiah or called the Messiah, he could endanger the whole community. So think, think of it, um, the, the Jews are living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. The Romans want peace and calm because when you have peace and calm, you have prosperity. Um, the, um, the whole idea uh, around the fear of angering God might actually delay the coming of who the real Messiah is. So Paul is worried about that. He thinks that Jesus as the Messiah is a form of blasphemy. He fears the angering of the Romans, as I just talked about. He saw it as a huge catastrophe for Judaism, a huge catastrophe that people were being led away from the Torah, from the oral tradition, from God. So again, he has a, a, a strong rationale for why he does what he does. And he gets to the point where he can't take it anymore. He's in Jerusalem and he's seeing all these observant Jews all of a sudden who are calling themselves people of the way um, and, and are starting a sect of Judaism. And he can't stand it because he feels like people are turning away from God. And he was so compelled that he felt like he really needed to be one of the folks who eradicated people who were believing in Jesus being the Messiah, right? And so he takes action. Um, and uh, again, uh, these are things that he, uh, with the ex that he or Luke in Acts of the Apostles talks about. So. Um, So um, in Acts of the Apostles, talking about Paul, it says, he entered house after house, seizing men and women and sending them to prison. So he, he had the permission of the chief rabbi um, in the temple, the chief priest in the temple in Jerusalem to do this. And then he talks about in Galatians, how savagely, savagely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. So he recognizes what he did. And people at that time, if they were uh, arrested by Paul or sent to prison, they might be lashed, they might be beat, they might be hung because they were going against the law and the Torah. But I love this. In the meantime, the apostles, Jesus' apostles, aren't really staying in Jerusalem, they're out traveling. So they're going to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, and they're taking the message of Jesus to other Jews. And you guessed it, Paul cannot stand it. He cannot stand it. So he's kind of cleaned up Jerusalem in his mind. But now the word of Jesus and this sect that is part of Judaism um, is heading for other places. And this drives Paul 
absolutely crazy. So what does he do? Paul heads out um, and he goes to Damascus. So I just want to pause for a second. Are there any questions? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Is this making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. helpful. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what happens on the road to Damascus in just a minute. But I wanted to give a little bit more context about Paul. Okay. And his writing. So Paul's epistles, Paul is the earliest writer. And he comes about 20 years after Jesus' death is when he starts writing his epistles, his letters. And I think this is important because when you look at the Gospels, um, Matthew, I mean, Mark is written between 40 and 60 CE. Matthew and Luke, 80 to 90 CE. And John, around 100 CE. So really, Paul is the first writer. Um, we know um, the Acts of the Apostles, which we believe is written by Luke, was written in 70 to 90 CE. The other interesting thing about Paul's writing is that he says very little about Jesus' human life. If you get a chance, page through some of what Paul has written, and you will find very little about Jesus' human, human life. A lot of what Paul writes is about the spirit of the resurrected Jesus, right? The other thing is that Paul is influenced. I talked a little bit about this before. He's influenced by living under Roman rule, and he's influenced by um, the uh, Hellenistic philosophies. So um, Paul would have been an opponent of what was happening with the Roman Empire, living under the oppression. He lived under it. He witnessed what happened. Um, and if you notice Paul's message, he really focuses on working to transcend the barriers, right? He talks about, you know, we are neither, neither, neither man or woman, or, you know, he really, he really gets to, we're all allowed to eat at the same table. So um, he, he, he's influenced by what it feels like to live under the injustices of the Roman Empire. And his letters focus on trying to transcend that. The other influence that Paul has is the influence of Hellenistic philosophy, um, which happens well before Christ, but continues through. And it's making sense of the world using reason right? Astronomy, mathematics, ethics, logic, rhetoric. And Paul would have been uncomfortable with this influence because if you can explain the stars, if you can explain things with numbers, if you understand logic or, metaphys or, or metaphys metaphysics, why do you need God, right? So many of those things were explained by God. You know, who put the stars in the sky? God, yes, but there's a pattern to the stars. There's a science to it. What about logic? You know, does, does, the, do the, does the Torah defy what is logical? So he had these influences going on around him, like we all do, you know, where we are, uh, we are influenced by how we grow up, the culture we live in, um, who our family is, all those things, and the country we live in. So, so Paul was influenced by living under Roman rule and understanding that there were things in the world going on that took people, he thought, took people away from God. But then, but then something happens for Paul. Wait for it. So Paul um, is... I think I told you, so he's in Jerusalem, but he finds out that the apostles are spreading the word about Jesus all over. And he gets really upset and he gets permission again from the high priest. And he's going to go after uh, the folks in other countries who are observant Jews, who are um, being led astray 
with this message that Jesus is the Messiah. So he's riding to Damascus. He's on a horse. Um, and uh, according to Acts, Acts of the Apostles, which is written by Luke, um, here's what happens. Paul is struck by a bright light. It's said that he falls off of his horse um, and he hears these words, Saul, which is his given name. Why are you persecuting me? And Paul or Saul asks, who, who, you know, who, who is talking to me? What voice is that? And the reply is, I am Jesus and you are persecuting me. And Jesus instructs Paul to wait for, for further directions from Damascus. Now, isn't this interesting? Because Paul, who doesn't believe in the risen Christ, now sees the risen Christ. Hmm. He actually does see the risen Christ who has appeared to him just as the apostles did. Remember when Jesus uh, uh, appears to the apostles multiple times in the scriptures after he's died and resurrected. Keep that in mind because that's important in terms of who Paul says he is and who he becomes. So here he is. Um, this is a painting by um, Caravaggio. Uh, there are hundreds of depictions of Paul um, on the road to Damascus, the story. Um, I picked this one because of the light and the shadow and the position of Paul laying on his back off of his horse, um, reaching up like he can't see what's going on, can't understand what's going on, flat on his back on the ground. Um, and, and he sees the risen Jesus. And that has this enormous impact on, on his life. It's the turning point in his life. Okay. So um, some people call this Paul's conversion. But I wonder, is it conversion or is it a revelation? And I want to put it into a little bit of context for you. So what we know about Paul is that he never changes his religion. He never says, I'm a Christian. He is, he becomes a follower of Jesus, person of the way. So he doesn't change his religion. He never says he's not Jewish. He never, ever says he's not Jewish. And in thinking in the way of the Torah, and of the oral tradition, Paul might have believed that he was called by God in the same way that God might call Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses or any of the other prophets. So he, he, he keeps hold of himself as, an, as a Jewish person. He never says that he's not Jewish. And I think the revelation is that he does see Jesus, right? And he uses this as an argument about him being an apostle. And he says to those who doubt, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? Just like the other apostles who see um, Jesus when he returns in the upper room. So, so Paul sees himself as an apostle. And he goes on to say, last of all, he appeared to me too. It was as though I was born when, on, when, when no one, it should be no one expected it. Hmm. So he, he becomes, he sees himself as an apostle. And if we look at the scriptures, Jesus' apostles are the ones who Jesus appears to. Hmm. And then there's, there's Paul, who didn't know Jesus, who was not an apostle. But Jesus chooses to appear to Paul. So conversion or revelation, something to think about. Mm. Well, we know that Paul goes on to uh, write letters. Oh, wait, I missed a part of the story. I missed a part of the story. So after 
after Paul is on the road to Damascus and he has, he falls off the horse and he, he's struck blind. Um, someone comes along whose name is um, Aeneas sent by God to restore Paul's sight. So Paul's sight is restored. But interestingly enough, he doesn't immediately go off and start his mission work. He takes some time away and it says he goes to Arabia. And um, in one of the scriptures, it says something like, I didn't speak with anybody else about it. I just picked myself up and went on my way to Arabia. And there he's probably having some discernment about what is God calling him to do. So then he comes back from that and he starts his mission and he's writing, he starts writing, well, first he visits, he visits different parts of the area, but I just wanted to talk to you about the Pauline letters. These are the epistles that Paul wrote. So if you notice my math up there, <laughs> um, seven plus six plus one. Um, so, you know, we used to think that Paul actually wrote all the epistles, right? Um, but scholars have found that he really only wrote seven. And so they're listed here. He wrote 1 Thessalonians, he wrote Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, and Romans, seven, okay? But then there are other letters that people believe were written by Paul, but the scholarship shows that they were written by someone else. Now, it, it wasn't, this was not plagiarism. It was... Um, it was uh, a habit of the times that if you really admired someone, if you were a follower of that person, if you admired their philosophy, if you thought they were a, a good writer, that you would write um, under the, pseudo the pseudonym of that person. And so there are six of Paul's letters, which are called <clears throat> Deuteropauline letters, not written by Paul, but written by Paul's followers. So we have um, Colossians, Ephesians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And then we have plus one, which is Hebrews. And it's sometimes included as uh, a, a, a letter written by a pseudonym of Paul or not. Um, so um, so we have 14 total, but only seven that were actually written by Paul. How do, how do scholars know this? Um, I believe it's something called proof texting, that scholars could see the difference in the language and the tone of the letters that Paul wrote, the seven letters that Paul wrote, versus the letters that came afterwards. Hmm. So that there was, there's a change in the tone, in the writing, in the, in the philosophy. So you know how I said in the beginning, I did not like Paul. <laughs> I didn't like Paul. And in fact, in seminary, I <laughs> would turn my nose up at studying him. I didn't <laughs> like him. He was misogynist. You know, well, here's the truth. The things that I disliked about Paul, he didn't even write. So the things in the... Uh, in the 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 uh, the six letters, the six letters that are not attributed to Paul, say things like women should be subservient to their husbands and slaves must obey their masters. And uh, what scholars believe was happening was that um, uh, people who came after Paul were trying to like tone things down a little bit, because Paul's message was very very radical, and. Um, if you if you are talking about equality and equity and and not having slaves and everything held equal, um, you are going to ruffle feathers because the whole kingdom, the whole Roman Empire, and and you know is based on that hierarchy. And so uh, the followers of Paul who are writing these letters were trying to tone things down a little bit. What's acceptable? What's not going to get us into trouble? And it's not that they were 
trying to squirm out of what Paul said, but what they were trying to do was, I think, protect the people, right? You don't want to make trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I think they were trying to protect people and making Paul's Paul's teachings safer. So uh, I think I've mentioned that Paul took four journeys. Uh, He traveled the equivalent of about 10,000 miles, either by land or by sea. And tonight, I just wanted to show you all the different places that he traveled on his different, on his journeys. So just for context, okay, um, here, here's Italy. Right, here's Greece, here's Athens, Delphi, Philippi, Thessalonica, Macedonia. We come over into what was then Asia Minor, um, Cappadocia, Antioch, Perga, Cyprus, Damascus is over here. So look how far he came when he. when he went to when he went to Damascus, think of traveling. So here's, let's see, where's my pointer? Here's Jerusalem, right? And he travels this way to Damascus on a horse, a very long journey. But then he travels all over this part of the country on his missions, ten thousand miles. Imagine horseback, walking, ships, incredible hardship, probably. So here's a little bit larger map. Let me go on to the next one. So Paul's first journey. So here, here's what we'll do. I, I want to take you through where the journeys were, first, second, third, and fourth, and where he stopped along the way. And then next week, we'll visit the first journey and the second journey in detail and look at the scriptures that go with it. So a lot of this is, is contextual, but just so that you know. So this is his his first journey after Damascus. Was there a question? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, So um, he sets out and let's see. So here's Damascus. He's been spending some time in Arabia down here. Um, Can you all see my pointer okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he starts out here. And he goes over to Cyprus and he goes to uh, Antioch, which is in Turkey. And he goes to Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. So he's taking kind of this moon shaped trip um, around um, Cyprus and Turkey and Antioch. And what he does is now that he has had this revelation about Jesus, he goes to the synagogues that are in those cities and he starts to preach the coming of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, the risen savior. What a turnaround this is because he sets out to Damascus with the sole purpose of kind of rounding up Jewish people who believe in Jesus as the Messiah and then the turnaround because of his, his revelation is that he's going to preach in synagogues in these different cities. Oh, okay. So this is his second journey. And he goes back to Iconium and Lystra to visit because he's been there before. But now he adds on Macedonia. So he's going up here. He goes to Greece, right here, Corinth and Athens. Um, He goes to um, Ephesus. Um, And he makes this whole circle. He goes to Antioch. He makes this huge circle around the area. I mean, think of the effort. Think of the effort, the dangers, um, the passion that he must have had for spreading the news that Jesus was the Messiah. I would think two journeys would be enough, but he takes four. So then he goes further 
And if you can see the blue line here, so he's he goes back again and he's visiting people. He's visiting people in Turkey. We know this because um, he writes letters to folks. He writes letters to the Corinthians. Um, he's, he's writing letters and he's revisiting. Um, he crosses the Aegean Sea. He goes back to Greece and to Corneth. Um, again, just journeying all over. He takes a trip across the Mediterranean, across the Aegean Sea. Um, and I, I looked up to see, like, how long would a trip like this take? And, you know, two years or three years of traveling um, is what it would take for him to make these these journeys that he that he's he's making. And then um, he makes his fourth journey. And if you notice the purple line, um, he goes to the Isle of Crete. And then he goes to uh, Sicily, and then he goes to Rome. And what we're told is that Rome is uh, where he is martyred. But we'll talk we'll talk more about that um, next. Uh, not next week, but the week after. So what a journey. So um, as I said before, next week, March 7th, we'll talk about those journeys in, in detail, his first journey and his second journey. Uh, fascinating, all the things that he does and talks about. Um, are there any any questions so far? I have a question. Okay. Um, what is he living on when he's doing this? Are people taking him in or, you know, what's that? The that's, that's a great, that's a great question. Thank you. So, so yes. So he has patrons who are helping them, him. And, um, and he actually mentions who they are. Um, often they're, um, they're women and men, Aquila, Prisca, um, I'll, I'll talk about all the people who are um, either traveling with him or supporting him. So people who have accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. And uh, so uh, varying levels of wealth and those folks are supporting him. But also, I think in, in the, in the times that, that um, Paul was living in, the need to offer hospitality was great. Like you wouldn't let someone die of thirst and you wouldn't let someone go hungry if you could help it. And so he had help along the way, but he did have um, his own disciples, if you will, people who helped him. He wasn't doing this alone. And in fact, on his journeys, he pairs up with Barnabas mm -hmm. and there are others that he pairs up with and goes with. So, you know, Jesus says where, um, when, uh, two or more are gathered together, or I'm sending you out, go two by two. Um, Paul is is engaging in that. He's going two by two, supported by um, folks who can help him financially. So Ramona, I would like to have a list of the, uh, go back to the list of books that Paul actually wrote. Okay. Or the letters, I mean. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I because I would like to read those, mm -hmm. knowing that those are actually the the ones that. Yes. Have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I took a screenshot of that page. Oh, for some yeah, reason. I never remember to do screenshots. <laughs> I have to use. Pen and pencil. <laughs> Great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Oops. Good night. So, um, if you are looking, for, if you are looking, oops, sorry. If you are looking for some. Um, interesting books about Paul. Um, these are some that I am using as I put uh, our course together. Uh, Paul the Traveler, which is one that um, Julie 
uh, recommended to me. Um, that's by Ernie Bradford. Um, St. Paul, the apostle we love to hate, Karen Armstrong. <laughs> it, is, it is a really good read. Uh, this one is called um, Paul, the Man and the Myth. And it's by Kelvin Rotzel, R-O-E-T-Z-E-L. And uh, there's also one called The Writings of Paul, and I have chopped off the author. I'm sorry, I'll have to give you the author on that next week. So um, again, uh, this evening's class was getting to know Paul, who he was, the context of, uh, of um, what was happening around him, um, that he was an observant Jew, that he was a Pharisee, that he has a revelation, um, that he tells us about himself in his letters. So again, this was just to give context, uh, kind of an overall understanding of who Paul is, where he comes from, why he thought the way he thought. And then next week, we'll go into his journeys, his first and second journey, and all the interesting things that happen. And then, uh, not the, the, and then the last class will focus on his last journeys. So do folks have questions or feedback? This is my first time um, teaching about Paul. And so I would really appreciate feedback or um, if you found it interesting or what, what more might be helpful in a first class. Well, I learned a great deal about Paul that I didn't know. So thank, thank you. you. I, I did not have a good sense of, um, of who he as a person was, mm -hmm. really never had looked into that. So thank you. That was really helpful to get a feel for where he came from, why he thought like he did. That was helpful. Yeah. And, and Pat, just to pick up on that, you know, I think Christianity, has a tendency to demonize who Paul was before he had his revelation. Mm -hmm. And it's used, um, it's, it's used in an anti-Semitic way sometimes mm -hmm. to characterize the Pharisees, to characterize people who say that they are observant Jews. Um, and so again, I think even in our modern day, how we think about Paul, um, we need to think about um, what what hatred or anti-Semitism we bring along with that initial image of Paul. And if you look at some of the um, some of the uh, images of Paul um, before he has his revelation, um, they are very stereotypically um, um, they are stereotypically what's the word I want to say? They are stereotypes of how we sometimes think of um, Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this was very interesting on a number of uh, different levels, but uh, I had never been a big fan of Paul, St. Paul to begin with. But, uh, well, I'm moving a little closer to it now <laughs> yeah i i've gone from i hate you paul to <clears throat> interesting paul's kind of interesting <laughs> yeah he is but you it's know his syntax is terrible <laughs> oh, God, yes. as a lector you know i've always struggled with the syntax <laughs> Well, think of all the translations it's gone oh, through. Oh, I know, I know, it's right? not fair, but you know, <laughs> still, you know, okay, it's signed by. Oh, oh, this is Saint Paul, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's probably very tired when he wrote. He's yes. writing at night. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. Did he it's not a good writing. time to be revising okay. and clarifying your thoughts. Writing at night is <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> I speak from experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Ramon, I appreciated the way you presented it. Also, it was it was easy to digest. Oh, thank you. As we ran along. Thank you. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I get excited about um, about putting these together. So, um, you know, in the beginning, I sort of like dread it. Oh, I've got to put this together. And then I get into it and I start learning things. And I think about, you know, how, how to share this with others. And it becomes really kind of an exciting proposition for me. Uh, so I'm grateful to be able to do it um, and to get your feedback. And I enjoy it. I enjoy it. No, it's very good. Yeah. Thank you. We'll look yeah. forward to next week. Yes. You're welcome. Thank right. you so much. Well, thank you, everyone. There is a, a prayer that we'll say um, to end. This is also another prayer by Paul. Maybe we can say this together. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I would wish everyone a wonderful night, and uh, hopefully I'll... See you on Sunday, maybe some of you on Saturday for um, Greg Schaffner's um, memorial service. And I will see you. I, I, I am reminded that Greg often tuned in and participated yeah. in these, and I am thinking of him tonight. Take care, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Night.